So good morning, uh, good afternoon everybody. Um, my name is Martin Owen, um, I'm the CEO of Corso. Um, so thank you for attending the webinar and taking time out. Um, I'm going to take you through a presentation on uh, road mapping with IBM Rational System Architect. Okay, so a little bit about, about Corso. Um, we're created in 2011. We've got offices in the US, UK and Australia. Uh, we created the, the organisation to address gaps in uh, enterprise architecture tooling and strategic planning tooling. So we're primarily a product company. We also support those products with consulting. We're a, an IBM business partner. Um, the founders of the company, including myself, all worked for the IBM rational team, um, where we led uh, both the product from a product management perspective and also managing things like cloud infrastructure. Um, the organization in the US is run by John Lederer, who also worked at um, Telelogic, uh, who previously owned System Architect, and Popkin Software, the originators of System Architect. So as I mentioned, we're IBM partners on products. We've also got um, cloud support, so we can host products on the cloud. You can get System Architect and IBM Rational Focal Point, which is a portfolio management tool, um, on our cloud, and you can rent that on a monthly basis. We're also certified TOGAF and Archimate practitioners, and our tools are certified as Archimate compliant and TOGAF compliant. So a little bit about the agenda today. We're going to be covering uh, workspaces, which are a fundamental concept for road mapping. Um, business motivation, which takes us through the goals and the strategy and the tactics of the organization and how that affects road mapping. We'll talk a little bit about implementation and migration and how you model those concepts. And then we'll discuss work packages and what that means. Um, timelines, which are the, a very visual aspect of road mapping. And we'll talk about costing, and costing affects everything that you do because you're driven by bottom line cost. Um, method wizard, which is a, a way of building methods very quickly, and relationships. And then we'll look at life cycles and what life cycles are and what they mean to road mapping. So the presentation itself will take about 35 minutes to go through. Um, again, we can field questions as you go along via the uh, web interface or we can field questions um, when you feel like it's relevant at the end. Okay, so let's have a little look at the strategic planning lifecycle um, and enterprise architecture. So the graphic that you're looking at on the right-hand side here is the TOGAF ADM. So this is the lifecycle or the process uh, behind the Open Group Architecture Framework, TOGAF. And you'll see that this is a wheel. And as you move around the wheel, we've got architecture vision, uh, business architecture, specifying the IS architecture, technology architecture. And we can then look for opportunities and solutions. So as we start to plan out our architecture, the current state versus the future state, and then build what we call migration plans in stage F. And then also look at governance and how we govern solution building. And then in H, we go through change management. So this is cyclical. And what we've put around the outside of the ADM here are iterations. So you'll see that there are various places where we can do iterations. We can do the context of the architecture as an iteration. So what's the architecture for? We can build the architecture itself through architecture definition iteration. And we can also build transition planning iterations. And the other one there is architecture governance. So how do we govern, it, govern what we're doing and what we're building? So we're going to focus very much on transition planning iteration. So very much looking at opportunities and solutions. Um, so that's current state and future state architectures and how we move those through via migration plans um, into real architectures. Along the way, we will have a little bit of a look at some of the IS architecture and technology architecture in different states. So we do enterprise architecture modeling to help us visualize the architecture. We look at documentation reporting. Change in this life cycle uh, is slower than in traditional life cycles such as software development. So we're really talking here about things that happen in terms of change 
over months and years, yet rather than days and hours. So there are multiple uh, people involved, there are multiple plans, multiple programs, multiple projects involved in this. And the output here is an architecture blueprint with recommendations and constraints for what we can do moving forward. And what we need to do is decide between different blueprints in our organisation, look at the cost of those, look at the innovation, and plan out the timelines and roadmaps and make decisions. And that's really what we're going to focus on, are those timelines, roadmaps and costs. Okay, so I mentioned the concept of a workspace. Now, a workspace is a system architect piece of terminology, so it comes from the system architect tool. And it's actually a container of EA modeling artifacts. So it's really a self contained unit that contains definitions, diagrams, and symbols or shapes. It spans across multiple domains. So it can cover business modeling, the strategy of the organization, uh, the IT infrastructure, you know, organizational roles and responsibilities. We isolate a workspace for a dedicated project or program of work. And the idea behind a workspace is that we can baseline it at any moment in time. And we can also make sure that any changes in the workspace do not affect other workspaces so we can work in isolation. Um, the idea here is that workspaces allow us to control our architecture and also introduce the concept of time. Any changes we put into a workspace can be associated with tasks or change requests in other systems such as rational team concert. Okay, so let's, let's move ahead. Okay, so what we're looking at here um, is a example workspace pattern. And what you'll see here is that I could create, for example, a compliance program. Um, in the architecture itself, we can split two workspaces, X and Y, which both represent um, alternative options. And then we can choose workspace Y and generate our enterprise architecture version 1.3. We can then have coming into the organization an outsourcing initiative, where we outsource our IT, and then we can look at different architecture workspaces of A, B, and B2 and B1 and make a decision. Along the way, we may collect and incorporate feedback. So this might be something like an application portfolio management project where we're capturing applications across the IT estate from the organization. We might collect the feedback about those applications into our architecture and create workspace D. And then from workspace D, we may, may then create Enterprise Architecture version 2. And then we have a new project which comes in, a new initiative, which is an acquisition of an organization. We may spawn off Workspace Y. And what you'll see happening here is that these are all related to as is and to be architectures or different evaluations or compliance and governance or just refreshing the blueprint of the architecture. But what we end up with here is a series of workspaces. We have X, we have A, B2, B1, and we have Y. Okay, and along the way we've got baselined architectures of version 1.2, version 1.3, and version 2. So this is really a, a way of managing um, information in our architecture over time, and be able to have different users using different parts of the architecture. And you'll see these map very nicely to the ADM inside TOGAF. Okay, so another example of this is as-is and to-be architectures. So here's a scenario for as-is versus to-be. We can have an as-is architecture. We have an outs the outsourcing initiative that comes in. We then break off workspace X. We describe the architecture and it inherits the ar architecture from the baseline workspace. We then create Y with workspace Y. So these are exactly the same at the moment in terms of content. And we then change X and we change one of the data structures inside X. So we've now added a new table structure. 
But we've now taken, we then take Y, and we modify Y, we're adding in some extra technology components and modifying some business processes inside here. And then we look at the portfolio and we make some investment decisions. And we see now that based upon looking at the portfolio, we can see that we're going to make, actually save more money through alternative Y. So therefore, we baseline to version 1.4 of the architecture from Y. So in this scenario here, as is versus 2B, we were just looking at um, alternative options for making investment decisions. And that's one use of workspaces. Okay, so what we're going to look at next then um, is business motivation. And the reason why we're doing most of the things we're doing inside road mapping is because we're being driven by business goals, strategies, and new requirements. And those can be modelled inside our uh, plugin, which is called the Archimate plugin. So Archimate is a standard notation from the Open Group. It's complementary to TOGAF. It's a standard way of visualising um, enterprise architecture. So it has standard notation. Um, and in the next version of TOGAF, um, the Archimate is being used as the standard notation to describe TOGAF outputs. So we know that requirements can be at varying levels. Um, also, again, with tools like System Architect, you can also map into requirements management tools like DOORS. So if you want to go into full-blown requirements management, you can do that through, through things like DOORS. Okay, so that's really a little bit about business motivation. So let's have a look at System Architect. So we can actually open up here. You'll see here there's workspaces. And in System Architect, the workspace structure is shown through a tree. So we can see the root. We can see the sub-workspaces. So these are, are very similar to the PowerPoint I was showing you a minute ago, um, except for look, looking at this in, in inside the tool set itself. And at the bottom there of that root, you can see its properties in terms of its description. So what we're going to do now is we're now going to select a workspace. And this time we're going to select what's called the overall transition plan. So we can create a workspace which represents the overall state of our architecture. So it's representing the as-is and the 2B architectures in an overall transition plan view. And you'll see that at the top on the, on the toolbar. Okay, you'll see in our Explorer diagram on the left-hand side here, we've got some Archimate views. Or in system architect terms, these are called diagrams. And we can open up here the Archimate motivation view, and we can look at business goals. So what you'll see here on the screen is that we've now got the notation for a business goal in Archimate. And again, pointing out with Archimate, it's very, very strong on notation and visualization. We can zoom into this and have a, a look in more detail. You'll see at the top here, we've got stakeholders which are represented by a cylinder symbol. We've got the drivers, and we've got goals, and we've got requirements. We're actually dealing here with something called um, Archisurance. And Archisurance is the standard open group um, repository and uh, model. So it's all the sample content. It's exactly the same if you download anything to do with Archimate from the website. So this is about an insurance company and what we're looking to do here is we're looking to add in um, pet insurance to a car insurance organisation. So this is modelling the changes required to be able to enhance our business to now support pets, and pet insurance. And I mentioned requirements. Yep, so requirements are here at the bottom of the screen. You'll also see here, as I mentioned, with tools like Doors, we can send this information to doors, we can link back from doors. One of the more powerful things with System Architect is it supports a technique called OSLC, which is Open Services for Lifecycle Collaboration. This means that we can provide live links into other tools, so it's not just exchange of information. We can link the tools together and exchange requirements live into those repositories. And graphically, we can show doors links on our Diagrams. 
Okay, so that's what we're calling the business goals. We're mapping out the business goals. Um, I'm going to show you very quickly um, the IT goals for the organisation. So in a very similar manner on here, okay, we're mapping out the IT goals. We've colour coded these inside the tool set. Okay, so we've now got inside here uh, both business and IT goals in, in different colours. So the pink colour is the IT goals and the blue is for business. Okay, that's a little bit about what we're doing with, with business goals and drivers. So that's the reason why we're doing road mapping and we're modifying change to do with a pet insurance company over time. Now, what we're looking at on the screen here is something called implementation and migration. So the implementation and migration section here can be represented by models inside Archimate. So this is, this is quite different to um, how you may have seen other enterprise architecture um, notations work. Archimate supplies an implementation and migration extension in Archimate 2. So we can represent uh, plateaus and plateaus represent the state of your architecture at any moment in time. So that's exactly the same as a workspace. So plateaus can represent your workspaces. So if you remember back to the previous system object clips we were looking at, there was a tree there of workspaces. Each of those workspaces is really a plateau. So it's an isolated piece of work. We can then look at gaps between workspaces. So the symbol in the middle of the screen here is actually a gap. And those are effectively your transition plans between one plateau and the other plateau. So how do we get from 2013 architecture to 2013? Yeah, we look at a gap. And each of those gaps will generate deliverables and assets to enable us to get there. So what we're really doing here is we're modelling time, we're modelling the state of the architecture over time. So again, this is standard notation for Archimate. Okay, so let's take a little look at that. So again, inside Archimate, we have an implementation migration viewpoint. So I can look at the 2013 transition plan. So remembering this is the overall transition plan. And what we can see on here is our 2012 and 2013 architecture views. We'll just zoom in on this so you can see it better on your screens. We can look at the plateaus, represented by a box here. And if we open up a plateau, and have a look behind this, you'll see at the top there it's called an Archimate Plateau. What you'll also see here is that there's a workspace tab on the screen. So what we're doing here is we're showing the plateau and how it maps to a workspace. So this is interacting with system architects. So we've got the notation is representing physical workspaces that show how the architecture is organized. And this is manifested itself in the actual tool usage itself. So system architects can support multiple projects, multiple users, uh, with workspaces, and those workspaces can be visually represented inside a model. So we're actually showing here you know, what's in Arch Insurance 2012. And we can do the same for 2013. And we can show inside here how that links to a workspace. in exactly the same manner. Okay, now if we look at the gap between those two workspaces and edit that, one of the interesting things you'll see here is a, re a reference documents tab. And this will show us a UR set of URLs. Now one of the good things with System Architect is that you've got the ability to compare between workspaces. So you can show visual compares and you can do these both graphically by overlaying diagram views and you can do it through trees and tables. And you can also obviously build other models that represent things you're interested in. 
and you're going to list all of these outputs here inside the gap. So that makes the gaps very interesting because they're representing real live differences between workspaces. Okay, by the way, if you want to play with any of this technology, it is available on our cloud, so we can switch this on for you. And it's something you can play with and test. We have the samples up there and running for you. Okay, so let's have a look at another definition on here. Okay, and we've got two questions, so let me just pause for, for a second. So Martin, first question. Which version and add-ons of SA are being used in the demo? Okay, so the question here is which um, add-on and which version of System Architect is being used in the demo. So we're using version 11.4.2.2. And the add-on uh, for Archivate is version 2.1. And the second question is, are workspaces embedded within the SA Encyclopedia, or are they located elsewhere? Um, so the workspaces are always inside the same encyclopedia. So they're not split across different repositories or anything else. They're inside the same place. Okay, so thank you for those questions. Okay, so... We're actually looking here at a deliverable. So this is how we model a deliverable. Yeah, and again, in exa exactly the same way on the screen here, we can look at reference documents. So we can use a URL to link to things like PowerPoints or web outputs or anything else on the screen. Okay, pet registry on here is representing a work package. And a work package is a unit of work uh, with a specified start and end date. And you'll see the start and end date on the screen here. And we'll talk a little bit about work packages later on. So the next thing I'm going to do here is just drive down into a child diagram that's behind 2013. The plateau. Okay, so as well as representing a workspace, um, we can obviously connect uh, this symbol to a, a child diagram. So what I'm going to do here is just move up to the top of the screen here and click on the child icon. And this takes us now into a sub-diagram. And inside the sub-diagram here, you're now looking at a, a deeper level view here of that plateau. Now one thing to point out on here, the Archimate add-on we've got also supports representational consistency. And what that means is that any time I put two objects onto the screen, if there's a, an association between them, it'll draw that association for me, live. Okay, so the model is automatically refreshed and automatically built for you. Okay, also, obviously, you're using um, objects on here, so you declare the object once and only once inside the repository. So, again... Yeah, this is looking at a requirement, it realises goals. If I dropped a goal onto this screen, we'd have the association between the requirements and the goal drawn automatically for us. Okay. So let's move back to the parent. Okay, now if we look behind pet registry on here, now pet registry is a, a work package, so the diagram behind here that we're showing um, is again an implementation migration diagram. And here we're showing why we're changing things, what we're changing, and the change activity. So that's how we've organised this view. And what you'll see here in the middle of the screen, you'll see two... A, Two new symbols we haven't shown you before, which are part of Archimate. Two new definitions, actually. Um, and the two square boxes on there are application components. And the symbol with a circle on is an application service. So if you're doing a service-oriented architecture, um, Archimate supports that very, very well. Okay, so again, we're showing change activities on here, which obviously related to strategy and transition plans. 
Okay, so as we mentioned before, um, work packages themselves are very important because they represent uh, pieces of work with a given start and end date. Work packages can be defined at various levels, i.e. they can represent various things. Those things could be programs, they could be individual tasks, they could be projects, uh, they could be individual work items. Um, so the nice thing about with Archimate is it doesn't um, define a project as such, but you can represent it with a work package. What we've also done is we've, add, we've added in the concept of a milestone to a work package. So as you're defining your unit of work, you can also have set milestones that you want to reach or hit over time. And that's obviously quite important because it then means that we can have um, milestones with a start and end date. Now what we also then have is a timeline. And a timeline is a diagram view that represents information over time. And what it shows us on here is it shows us the each work package, and I'll actually show you this live in, in a second, but it shows you each work package live horizontally, and then each pie that you see on the timeline here is representing a milestone within that work package. So you'll see at the bottom there there's something called pet registry. Um, you'll see the timeline at the bottom is set from 2011 to 2015. And now what it's automatically showing us where those milestones fit within the work package. So let's have a look at some of those, those concepts. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is open up an Archimate project diagram. And here we'll see our pet insurance program. And here we have three work packages on the screen here. And for each of those work packages, we've connected it into deliverables. Okay, so first of all, we'll open up Ensure Your Pet Campaign. That's a work package. You'll see it's got a start and end date on here, 2013 to 2014. What you'll also see at the top here, one of the tabs, is called Milestones. Okay, and this one's actually set to a set of blank milestones. Okay, but we'll have a look at those, but each milestone has a milestone end date. So let's take a look at, let's just count on this one. We'll have a look at Pet Registry. And pet Registry was the one we were looking at a moment ago. So again, start and end dates are on there, 2012 to 2017. We look at the milestones property, and what you'll see on here is we have a registry close, execution, initiation. So a series of milestones and milestone dates for that work package. And you can give these whatever milestone names you like. So let's have a look at how that manifests itself inside a timeline. Okay, so this is our timeline diagram, and you'll see automatically on here we've got three projects. If you want to add projects to this timeline diagram, or work packages, it's just a matter of dragging and dropping them from the browser, from the Explorer view. So let's zoom in so you can see this. And what you'll see here at the bottom of the screen, um, we've got the pet registry project. So it's our work package. You'll see registry execution is a milestone of 0201 2013. So you'll see this is the same underlying definition as you looked at a moment ago on the work package view. And there's registry execution in the middle. A 
And we'll just define that. Now, the interesting thing we've got on here is we've got the milestone date, but you'll also see there's three other attributes on there called cost savings, classification, and resources, which are set to low, high, and low. And that's why you're seeing two green shades for a cheese inside the pie, and you're seeing low is set to red. Now, the segments, or the cheeses within the pie, are completely customizable. So we've set it to three inside here, and these are representing the status of either your organization, or IT, or anything else you want to state, at that milestone end date. So you can add your own attributes in here. Each time you add your own attributes, it'll increase the segments inside the pie. So if you want to have six segments representing attributes, you can do that. You can customize the tool very quickly and easily to do that. So what I'm going to do on here is just change cost savings to be medium and just press apply. And automatically you'll see the color changes on the pie. Okay, so again, it's representational consistent. So it's actually representing the underlying model information. Okay, so it's just zooming out, and the date range on here is set to 2013 to 2014. Um, you can also see we've got dependency lines on there on the screen as well. But what I'm going to do first of all is edit the timeline. So I'm just going to specify the start date. to be 2012 and the end date to be 2015 and then we'll set the interval to be one uh, quarter. So automatically the timeline refreshes itself and you now see there's a, a new set of milestones appear on the screen automatically. So it configures itself. The big box at the bottom of the screen is a legend and it's showing you the colours and the pie values. Okay, and I'm just moving around on the screen here, um, a dependency line between milestones. So I can start to look at critical paths. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit now about costing. So, work packages and deliverables are associated with cost. Okay, so everything that we, we do has a cost associated with it. So, so we now have, as part of road mapping, um, costing attributes. So we've got the budgeted cost and the actual cost. So the budgeted cost is what we've planned for, and the actual cost is the cost that's taking place. And obviously we can import those from other tools such as Excel. Um, and we also have at Corso another tool called Corso Connections, which allows you to do things like form-based data capture and integrations to other tools. So that can be used as well. You can also export those attributes out of the tool as well. Okay, so let's go back and, and open up our project diagram. So we're looking at our project viewpoint. So as we mentioned before, every project has deliverables. So we have the start and end date again, inside there. And if you look at create campaign, which is a deliverable, we've also got a new tab on here called costs. And here you see the budgeted cost and the actual cost. Okay, so the budgeted cost and the actual cost are actually under running here. Uh, automatically, inside the Archimate plugin, then costs are totaled for us. So what we can see on the screen here is the total budget cost. We can see the sum of the budgeted cost and the sum of the actual cost. And there's a checkbox on there, or a tick box, called over budget. That gets filled in automatically based on calculations from the deliverables. So again, as well as being representationally consistent of the model view, the attributes themselves are calculated as well. So it's keeping the model data consistent.
Okay. Okay, so I'm now going to open up an explorer diagram. Um, so for those of you that don't know, an explorer diagram is a generic diagram inside System Architect that we can use for lots of things, but especially what we call landscape style diagrams. So this is like a box in a box diagram. So what you're looking at here are all the work packages I've got inside my encyclopedia. And automatically what's happening on here is it's now colouring in for us based on what we call the heat map manager, work packages that are out of budget. So where that checkbox says we're out of budget inside the work package definition, it gets uh, colours in automatically via the heat map manager. So this is like an analytic tool you can run to colour in or change symbol shapes based on properties inside the repository. So again, very simple costing on the tool um, and graphically showing those costs. Okay, so we're going to sort of have a very quick look at something called method wizard now. And so we've talked a lot about um, timelining, we've looked a lot of, at workspaces um, and how we do transition plans and how we look at packages of work within work packages. Building a model is, is very important. So I'm going to show you something called method wizard. This helps you speed up your model creation. Um, it understands your meta models very, very quickly and easily. So one of the things so far, we looked at a lot of information. If you don't know where to, where to start, the method wizard will help you to start in the right place. Okay, so it guides a user through creating models. In our, te in our testing, um, this can shortcut the creation of a model by up to about 13 times. Okay, so it's very, very quick in terms of cost savings for you. What we're doing here is we're opening up Arc Insurance 2013. So this is an individual workspace that's representing the state of the architecture in 2013. So we're coming out of the overall timeline view now. So you'll see there's much more content in here because we've got some deep architectural artifacts. So I'm going to open up something called the Archimate Application Usage View. So this is showing in this particular workspace, it's showing how the applications are used. And what you'll see on here is that we've got this diagram representing a business service. It's actually representing business processes at the top through to application services to the symbols at the bottom, which are application components. So this is showing the applications and how they're used by business processes. So on here we've got at the top handle claim. Um, going all the way through to pay, which is a business process with inside it, represented by payment service, which is an application service. And what we haven't done yet is shown how any applications relate to that application service. So we're going to use something called Method Wizard. So in the top left-hand corner here, you'll see there's a magic wand. If I set that magic wand, we call it a magic line, and I draw a line between the application component and the application service, the tool now pops me up with the method wizard. So this is now saying which path do you want to create. So we don't have to understand the whole toolbar at the top of the screen. So it's now saying there are three things you can do on here. There are three, way, three ways to create that path. So an application component can either realize uh, an application service or it can trigger an application service, or it can realize indirectly the application service. So what we're going to do on here is we're going to select indirectly realizes. Okay, so an indirect relationship means that we go through other objects to form that connection. And what we can say to the tool here is how do you want to create that path inside the tool set? So we're going to create or select valid objects. So this helps you both understand the model and create model content at the same time. And we're going to say just draw me the indirect relationship. So now it tells me that for an application component to connect to an application service, 
indirectly, it goes through an application function. And it tells me the two symbols on the screen here. So I've got Home and Away Policy Administration on the left-hand side, and the Payment Service on the right-hand side. If I select Application Function, it now tells me that already in the repository, I've got something called Policy Creation, which is connected to both objects. So that's probably the thing that I want to use. And if I select that, it fills in Policy Creation. And if I press Finish here, it'll draw the line automatically on the screen. And it sets it to a different colour as well, which makes it an indirect relationship. So that's just a little bit about Method Wizard, what Method Wizard does. And it understands the whole of the, the model. So now we're on the application usage view. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about life cycles. So life cycles are really important. Okay? So life cycles help us to look at the object, or any object, in our architecture over time. So we can model life cycles within a workspace. They show the, the life cycle of an object as it moves through its lifetime. We've provided two sets of life cycles. Now, generally these belong to things that you're going to implement or deploy in the organisation or things that you're going to use in the organisation. So, deployment is really about the IT view of the world. So, how, if you look at an application, how is an application deployed? What life cycle does it go through? So, we've, we've picked some life cycles on here, some default ones. So, birth, planning, the implementation of that object, when it goes into production, and then when it's retired, or sunset. And you can use your own terminology inside here. So these life cycles are set up so you can change them very quickly. So that generally belongs to IT, and the IT view of the world. We then have usage life cycles. So the usage life cycle shows how we're going to use that component. So if it's an application, what's the usage plan for it? that generally yet lives in the business unit or the business side of the house. So, when are we going to plan to use that asset? When are we going to train people in it? When is it going to be available? When is it decommissioned? And when is it sunset? When is it withdrawn? Okay, so, very different life cycles. One's the IT view of the world and one's the business view of the world. And there's a reason we do that. Because what we're looking for are gaps of where Maybe the business is starting to plan out a component to be used, but maybe you know, it's not going to be deployed yet for another 12 months. We're looking for those gaps where things aren't matching up. So, what you're looking at on the screen here, again, is the application usage view, as I mentioned. The life cycle on this diagram we've got tied to the application component, but you can tie, they are tied to technology components, um, but, and also uh, business processes. Here on the left-hand side of the browser, you'll see the lifecycle definitions. So you can actually go into those, and you can rename them here if you want to. And they have lifecycle types. Okay, so they're categorised. Each one of these is either being a deployment or a usage type. And you may have other lifecycle types you want to use, and you can put those into the tool as well. Okay, now on our screen here, we're going to zoom in so we can see information a bit closer here. So for our document management system application component here, you can see that we've got two columns. On the left-hand side are our deployment life cycles, and on the right-hand side are our usage life cycles. And we're displaying those inside the application component. And this is something called display mode inside System Architect. Okay, if I edit the definition of that application component, we've got a life cycles tab. So again, we're very consistent in the way we represent these things on tabs. And here, this first one is deployment life cycles, representing the left-hand side. So, birth, plan, implement, in production, and retired. And you can see next to that the synonyms that the user may be using. So, although it's called implement, they might call it implementation as a life cycle. 
Okay, and the same thing here when we look at the life cycle status on the usage side. Okay, so that's on page two. Again, it's showing, it's showing the information in a grid, in the definition dialog, with start and end dates. And on the right hand side, in the life cycles column on the application component. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why we have the objects coloured in. So let's look at the whole diagram. And again, we use the concept of the heat map manager. So we can run analytics again to colour in or change the shape of symbols. So one thing we can do here, what you'll notice as we load this up, is that we've got symbols in green. Okay, so that means it's an inactive usage. Sorry, active. Um, it's also got a dotted boundary. That means it's in production. So we've changed the pen style of the symbol for deployment attributes. We've changed the colour for the usage attributes. So automatically I can graphically, graphically look for gaps. So is something being used but it's still in planning mode? Um, I can graphically see on the diagram which things are out of kilter. And these analytics, by the way, can be configured yourselves. So you'll see on the screen here, I'm using the Analytic Builder Wizard, a very simple reporting tool. Uh, we put reports in here already. Uh, you can't change those reports through the editor, but you can change them through the definition dialog. But what I'm showing you here is we've changed the pen colour style to dotted for production application components. What you'll also see here on the right hand side of the heat map is this is showing you Archimate application life cycles for 2013. So this report has been run over a particular time span. So if you remember to the life cycles, each of them has a start and end date, which tells you what's happening to it over its life history. We can also use reports. So we ship a lot of reports with this tool. Here's an example report. And what we're looking to do here is to show lifecycle usage. So we're showing on the left hand side here the application component name. We're showing the name of the lifecycle and the start and end date and its lifecycle type. So again, I can, I can look at through textual reports at the whole of the lifecycle status across the whole model using reports. Again, look for gaps and look for things that don't make sense and inconsistencies. Very, very simple reporting. These types of reports take about two to three minutes to write through the graphical editor. They're very, very quick. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to do next, we're actually going to look at what's called an explorer diagram next. Okay, so the explorer diagram we saw earlier on, but we saw it in a landscape mode. Um, and landscape mode was the box in box style. So the explorer diagram allows us to look at impacts of changes over time. Okay, so we can look at this via things like concepts, like work packages. Um, we can also look at things um, filtered by time attributes. So again, one of the things we're going to show you on here is how standard road mapping, when you start to put time attributes, the concept of work packages and milestones into the tool, can be explored with the Explorer diagram. And this is really for impact analysis. Okay, so we're going to create a new diagram here, a new Explorer diagram. And this is representing our, our home and away application that we changed earlier on. This time we're going to make it into a, what's called a network style diagram. So this is not box in box, it's going to go in a network style across the diagram. Okay, I've just changed some attributes on here so I can tell it how many objects to represent. So how complex do I want to make this model? So 
So I'm going to go and find our home and away financial application component. And we drag that onto the screen. So it's drag and drop. We can get rid of this box around the outside. Um, that tells me the type of symbol it is in case I'm using more than one symbol. So we'll just remove that. And then we'll move this symbol to the top left hand corner. And if I right hand mouse click on this, I can now say expand the relationships. So we can say show the immediate relatives. And now it shows me everything inside the repository that I'm using. So I'm looking at the impact of application components and what it affects. And you'll see down there on the right hand side, we've got things like life cycle statuses, we've got work packages that appear. And I can filter these by date and time. It also shows me all the other application components I'm linked to. So if I'm looking at complexity of removing something from the portfolio, I can see exactly what impact it has. So I'm going to take the work package that it belongs to, legacy outphasing, I'm going to expand that. So now I'm looking at the work package that that application component was linked to, and I can see everything else that's affected by that work package. So this is a project viewpoint. So what are all, all the other things that are affected by the project that application component sits within? Yep. And there's my milestone. So again, you're seeing it's the same underlying set of attributes and definitions. We can then take legacy outphase, outphasing, and I've just isolated on its own. So now I'm looking at the project viewpoint, or the work package viewpoint. I can hide all the relations not connected to me. I'm now focused in directly on that work package. So this is a, now a, a work package viewpoint because it affects the application components I was looking at and that I was interested in. And you can save this diagram as a model, as a view. You can report on it. Um, we could tie it to um, another work package symbol in another diagram if you want to for a viewpoint. So we saw the milestone on there. Okay, I just want to show to you also that program timelines can be intra-project as well, intra-workspace. So although I showed you this timeline before in the overall transition plan, we can also look at um, the program timeline within a particular workspace. So this is looking at the 2013 view of the world of how we'd expect the work packages to look in 2013. Okay, so one last thing I want to show you on here, and then I'll open up the questions, uh, is very quickly how we then move on into strategic planning. So we've looked a lot about the architectural view of doing road mapping. Um, what we can now use it is in conjunction with tools like rational focal points. So we can now start to look at things like exporting work packages for prioritisation, so which ones are the most important to work on, because we can't do everything. We can export the timeline diagram as a Gantt chart, so we can put resources against it. Um, and we can also update the EA model back inside our tool set with results and values from the portfolio management tool. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take the work packages that are inside our tool set. I'm just going to send them across to Focal Point. So if you don't know, Focal Point is a, another IBM rational tool. Again, you can use it on our cloud if you want to. Um, it supports portfolio management. So I'm just going to log into the into focal point. Okay, so now automatically I'm going to manually log into into focal point. You're actually looking at our cloud, by the way, here. So this is how you access information on our cloud. Okay, I'm going to have a look what's called a workspace inside Focal Point. Now, this is a, a, a portfolio of applications for doing application portfolio management. So I've exported the, the um, work packages into Focal Point as projects. 
Okay, so I'll show you a little bit of this, but I'm not going to give you a full blown focal point demo. If you are interested in focal point, you can uh, request a demo from us. Um, but here I'm just going to list the projects. And you'll see, if we look at this list here, then we've got pet registry inside there, pet insurance profiles. The start and end date, you can see, on the right hand side here has come from System Architect. But there's many more attributes we can fill in here, inside focal point, because we may be doing collecting information about the application. Who uses it? What, what is it used for? Uh, what's its business benefit? Uh, what's its architectural fit? What business value does it provide? Uh, we can move it through workflow so we can accept that project into the tool set. And what I can now do is do something called um, pairwise comparison. So now I can look at which project has the highest priority. So pet registry yeah, versus an existing project. At the bottom here I can start to fill in uh, weighting factors for which one's the most important. And once we've done that little assessment on there, uh, we can then start to visualise uh, the importance and the ranking of that project in a, in a hierarchy. Okay, so what you'll see here on the screen is we've got pet, insurance, pet registry on there. Uh, it's not the highest in terms of priority because of how we ranked it. Um, but on the right hand side here, you can see there's other attributes as well as the cost, which has come from System Architect. Um, there's risks, business risks, there's a business score, net present value, uh, architectural fit. These all affect the weightings of that in terms of priority. We can adjust these. So we're really now into portfolio management, integrating with enterprise architecture. That's, that's what we really call strategic planning. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but just, just to say that that's really part of taking road mapping further forward into portfolio management. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is open this up for any more questions that we've got. Okay, so there's a question on here about do we interface to MS Project with, with milestones? Um, so we don't yet. Um, we do have a release coming up um, on our roadmap where we're fitting this into work breakdown structures inside MS Project. Um, but that's not going to be available until March. Okay, another question about the wizard. Does it only apply to Archimate? Um, so at the moment it does, but we have um, just built, and it's in QA now, a method wizard um, called method wizard roll your own. And that means it'll work with any meta model. Um, and you, if you customise the meta model yourself, then you can configure it to support those customisations. Um, we're also bringing out a DOGAF specific method wizard and a TOGAF 9 specific method wizard as well. Okay, and another question is, do we tie the life cycle stages to the milestones? And we haven't done, um, but we could do. So at the moment, the milestones are for a work package viewpoint. Um, the work package can connect to application components and technology components, which themselves have life cycles. But you can run a very simple report that shows you the difference between life cycle start and end times and milestones within work packages and look for differences. That's very easy to do. Okay, so I think that's the end of the questions. What I've also got up, put onto the screen here for you uh, are some next actions. So we actually have a blog at, at info.course03.com. Um, so you can go onto that blog, um, comment, leave feedback, have discussions with us about requirements. So some of the questions you raised here would be great, great questions to put onto the blog and interact with us. Um, we are running the, the webinar again, so if you've got colleagues that want to come to this, um, please contact us or register through our website. Um, and also, we've got evaluation. So if you want to run on our cloud, it's very, very quick for us to turn you on on our cloud and get you up and running and give you a month's access to play with the software. Okay, so I'll also open up the, the, the live and further questions by voice. Presentation mode is now disabled. Presentation mode is now disabled. Okay, so are there any more questions on the conference line? Are there any more questions on the conference line? Okay, so are there any more questions on the conference line?
Rational, uh, 11.4.2 installed. Okay. However, I cannot see the workspace functionality. How does it work? How can make that be active? Okay. You have to go into uh, SA Encyclopedia Manager and put on workspaces. If you drop us a, a support, at free.com, an email, that we will send you back some instructions on how to turn it on. Excuse me, I couldn't hear the answer. Yes, if you send an email to support at corso, C O R S O, free.com, then we will send you instructions on how to turn on work. Ah, oh, okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Are there any more questions at all? Um, this is uh, Kevin, uh, work for IBM. Hi, Kevin. Um, and we follow something called uh, Team Method, and we have a plugin called SA for Team SD. I don't know whether you're familiar with that stuff. Yeah, yeah very familiar, yeah. If we're using a plugin such as SA for Team SD, does that mean that we cannot at the same time, <laughs> in the same encyclopedia or in editing the same encyclopedia, use, uh, say, the Archimate uh, plugin? That's right, yes. They're, they're completely separate meta models. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a bit of a thing we run, we would run into. Yeah, I mean, you can you can run separate encyclopedias um, with, with different meta models, but you can't run the same or, or both meta models inside the same encyclopedia. Yeah, so you couldn't even have two different workspaces because that's nope. the same encyclopedia. Okay. Nope. But it's uh, at least gives us a, a great view of the kind of things you can do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and in fact, for, for Team SD, by the way, although that's an internal tool. Um, there is, because obviously we've been, we've been working on that tool as well. Yeah, okay. Another part of the company. Uh, but the guys are using some of the road mapping techniques we've got in here inside Team SD. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. So I'm if, interested in, is there somebody <coughs> to a way of finding out more about that? or? Yeah, if you speak to Craig Ravenkamp or Gisbert Kruzman. Yeah, I think Craig, I've got his name somewhere. I work with Gary Craig. I know this different. Oh, Gar Gary will know as well, yes. Gary would know as well. Okay, yeah. yeah so I work with uh, him quite a bit. You know, whenever we have any questions, we go to Gary, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, okay. okay. Thanks. But you can always reach out to us as well, by the way, with martin.owen at corso3.com. Yeah. What is your relationship to IBM? Is it just as, as a business partner? Yeah, we're, we're, actually, yeah, we're actually a business partner, um, and we, we do their internal plugins for Team SD. Um, yeah, we're, we're um, a value plus partner. So you actually were part of the development of the plugin for Team SD, or? Yes, yeah, we developed it here. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, great. Yeah. So we're, we're all actually all of the staff here at Corso are all ex IBM product team staff. Yeah, I was kind of getting that impression. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank, thank you once again for your time. Yeah, please feel free to reach out if you need any any more information. Thank you.